Happy New Year guys, we're back with another educational video and this week, you know, I decided to start off the year with something very non-controversial, like diet soda, because nobody gets far enough about this. I'm just kidding, watch the comments. Make sure you get in those comments, it's gonna be lit. I wanted to talk about diet soda because a lot of people make claims about artificial sweeteners that simply aren't supported by the data. When I was younger, and during my first contest prep, I'm gonna date myself, back in 2001, I avoided diet soda like the plague. I was told it was just as bad as regular soda. It's gonna make you fat. You know, you, you won't be able to get lean enough using diet soda. So I avoided it. And I can remember like being in my fridge, my, my dad had diet soda. I would just think, oh man, it'd be so nice just to taste, just to have a little taste of something like that. But no, can't do it. Um, and then actually after that, instead of just taking people's word for it and the, the bodybuilding magazines, I actually started looking at some of the literature and what I found was actually pretty, just pretty disappointing in terms of the idea that diet soda was bad for you. Just to give kind of a background, there is some research data showing that people who have obesity or type two diabetes tend to drink more diet soda. So you have that observational data. And then you have some data in rodents, huge amounts of artificial sweeteners are given and you see weird stuff. Like um, there was one study showing like an increase in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with really, really high, and I'm talking like 10,000 times the amount of artificial sweetener you could ever get from diet soda. So there's some of that data. And then there was a study that came out showing that, <laughs> Well, influencers uh, promoted as a study showing that artificial sweeteners were bad for the gut microbiome. It was actually a study looking at one strain of E. coli showing that when you gave a load of artificial sweeteners, I think it was sucralose, that it was uh, toxic to that particular strain of E. coli. No shit. when you put really high doses of pretty much anything on a Petri dish, it can be toxic to cells. Why this was surprising? I'm not sure. When it comes to diet soda and health and weight loss and all this kind of stuff, if we really want to make claims about it, what we should do is we should look at the human data and not just the observational studies because with observational studies, there can be reverse causality. Meaning if you have an association between diet soda and obese people, is it that diet soda causes obesity or contributes to obesity? Or is it people who are obese or overweight tend to drink more diet soda because they diet more often because they're trying to lose weight. In order to do this, we need to look at randomized controlled trials. Well, there are several. The one we're gonna talk about today was from 2016 uh, by Peters et al. And basically, they looked at 12 weeks of weight loss in people who either were instructed to consume 24 ounces of water or 24 ounces of diet soda per day. Why is this study important? Well, it was large. I think they had over 300 participants to start. Um, it was pretty well controlled and they had uh, monthly meetings where they would weigh the participants, they would give them nutritional instruction. And the important thing to note is both groups got the exact same instructions. The only difference between the groups was one group was asked to consume 24 ounces of diet soda per day. The other group was asked to consume water and completely refrain from um, non-nutritive sweeteners in beverages. No non-nutritive sweeteners in their coffee or those sorts of things. They did allow them to have like um, sugar-free gum and that sort of stuff. Uh, but as far as beverages went, no artificial sweeteners. The initial weight loss period was 12 weeks, but then they did a 40 week maintenance period. And they looked at uh, amount of weight loss and also a bunch of different blood markers of health like glucose, uh, blood lipids, those sorts of things. One other important thing to note is they basically asked them to consume the same calorie deficit. So they took, it wasn't super controlled. They took their BMR, multiplied it by 1.6 and had them consume those calories. Both groups also did the same amount of exercise. Like they gave them exercise instruction. And then when they assessed them at the end of the study, they looked to see if one group had more activity than the other and they didn't, they were the same. So what did they find? Well, before we get to that, hang on, I'm, I'm kind of thirsty. <sighs> Supposed to be consuming equal calories. Now, if the hypothesis about, you know, diet soda creating uh, a sweet craving and, and making you 
want to eat more sweet things or that it's somehow increasing your insulin and so you're going to store fat regardless of the calories you're consuming or that it disrupts the gut microbiota which is going to mess up your blood glucose and insulin sensitivity and all this kind of stuff. If that is true, we would expect to see this after a year. We did not see that. In fact, the researchers hypothesized that there would be no difference between the two groups. There actually was a difference. The diet soda group lost significantly more weight. Of the total participants in the study, the diet soda group lost three kilos more of body weight. They also kept off more weight during the maintenance period. I think it was like two and a half kilos more they kept off. That's of all people. Of the people who completed the study, so they had over 300 to start, um, and I think 223 actually completed the full study. I mean, they made it to all the meetings and they went through the entire thing. Of those data, there was a five kilo difference in weight loss. And again, better weight maintenance as well. The researchers kind of didn't really know what to make of this. That, you know, there was supposed to be kind of equal calorie deficit. Now, I think it's obvious that that didn't happen. I'm not saying that diet sodas are some kind of magical fat burner because they're not. Uh, there's no data to suggest that. What the researchers postulated, and I agree, is that people who were in the diet soda group were most likely, since they were getting some sweet flavor, perhaps it was less likely that they were seeking that out with other foods. Whereas the group that was getting only water might have tried to seek out the sweet flavor, that sweet reward through some other mechanism and probably were getting more calories. Now, interestingly, they looked at their blood glucose, they looked at their uh, blood lipids, all this sort of thing. There was no difference between the groups on any blood markers except for blood pressure was significantly lower in the artificial sweetener group. Now, they lost more weight. I'm not surprised the blood pressure was lower. That's probably an effective weight loss, not particularly diet soda. Furthermore, their triacylglycerides improved better in the diet soda group. Again, that is probably a function of better weight loss and not something inherent to diet soda. This is also in line with two other studies. Blackburn et al. also found that people who consumed artificial sweeteners versus no artificial sweeteners lost more weight and maintained more weight loss over a two-year time period. And Tate et al. found that over a six-month randomized control trial, people consuming non-nutritive sweeteners lost more weight and maintained more weight as well or maintain more weight loss rather. This seems to be somewhat consistent among the data. There are, I think there is a couple of randomized control trials that show no difference between diet soda and water, uh, which is what you would postulate if they were getting the same amount of calories. Now again, I don't think diet soda is a fat burner. What I think is that possibly it's satiating or provides some sort of appetite suppressant effect. I can tell you personally from my contest preps that I have used diet sodas as an appetite suppressant before. And the researchers did report that the water group, the water only group, reported greater appetite than the group getting the diet sodas. So I think what's most likely is that diet soda provides an appetite suppressant effect that may be beneficial for weight loss. And again, there was no difference in any health markers. So this idea that, you know, diet soda disrupts the gut microbiome and that messes with your insulin sensitivity and blood glucose control, all this kind of stuff. If that were true, we should have seen that in the blood markers. We didn't. When you give large amounts of various molecules, you can show really weird stuff in rodent studies. You have to be able to replicate that in actual outcome data in humans under conditions of normal intake. And under conditions of normal intake, not only do we not see that, we see that, you know, if anything, this might have a benefit. Now, I'm not saying you should drink diet soda. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you choose to drink diet soda, one, there's no evidence in humans under normal amounts that it's dangerous. And two, you cannot make the argument that it's obesogenic. In fact, you can make the opposite argument that it's a weight loss aid because in these studies, in these tightly controlled randomized control trials, we see more weight loss. Now again, that's not some kind of magical fat burning effect. That's likely that people are just consuming less calories. But again, that can be a useful tool. Here's the part where everybody's gonna go crazy. This study was funded by the American Beverage Association. 
However, the researchers requested specifically that since this study was funded by them, that they hire a third party independent group to look over the data and audit everything to make sure that nothing funky was going on. This was on the researcher's request. This group audited all the data, said everything was good to go. And again, this is still in line with other studies and replication is what we look for in science. If this was one study that stood alone and no other study supported it and there was maybe like opposite data and this study was funded by this group, then I'd say, okay, this is a little weird. We should be careful. But when it fits with the other data that's out there, when independent third party people are auditing the data and showing that it's good to go, we have to take the data at face value. One more thing to keep in mind, if your only criticism of a study is the funding source, it says more about your bias than the researchers. As someone who had their studies funded by uh, the Dairy Council, the Egg Nutrition Center, and a little bit from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, I can tell you I never met anybody from most of those associations. I met one person from the Egg Nutrition Center. It was about a 45 to 90 second conversation if, my, if I recall correctly. It was at a scientific conference. My advisor introduced me to him, this person who was on the Egg Nutrition Board. And the conversation went something like this. Thank you so much for your funding. We really appreciate you allowing us to be able to do this research. And he said, oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for the research. Uh, we look forward to your, your um, bi-yearly reports. So basically, the only thing I had to do, the only thing they asked me to do, was report twice a year on what we were doing and what our findings were. They had no bearing on the outcome. And so some studies, I will say, and these are what you gotta be careful of, the, um, the companies that fund them will request that they have right of refusal for publishing the data, meaning they own the data and if they don't like what the data says, they can choose not to publish it. So that's a problem. But with my data, that was not the case. We could publish whatever we found. And in this particular study, that was not the case either. The researchers were allowed to publish whatever they found. And again, their hypothesis was that they would see no difference. And they were surprised when they saw a difference. I think that suggests that at the minimum, at the minimum, diet sodas aren't gonna make you fat. And they may possibly be a useful tool for people who have a little bit of a sweet tooth if they need some kind of appetite suppressant effect. If you want to read the study, you can click the link in the description. Also, if you want to buy some of our fine products, you can click the links in the description. Guys, I hope you're having a great start to your year, and I will catch you next week.